Good morning. This is a continuation of a series of talks, presentations about Unitarians, that we would get to know our history and the great people in it more. It's exciting for me. I've loved Margaret Fuller since I became aware of her. And on my door, I have a quote from her, which I understand better now, having done some more research than I had previously done. The quote, male and female represent the two sides of the great radical dualism. But in fact, they are perpetually passing into one another. Fluid hardens to solid, solid rushes to fluid. There is no wholly masculine man, no purely feminine woman. Margaret Fuller lived 200 years ago. She had a short life. And when I reflect upon what I consider her martyrdom, I feel sadness that such a brilliant, vibrant, giving, loving, courageous person would suffer so many indignities for no reason other than that she was born in a woman, a woman's body. The body of a woman made her an object of ridicule, contempt, and fear among so many of her contemporaries. Not only men who were misogynistic, but women who were programmed to believe that women had a place and it wasn't at the forefront of anything, but always as a subservient follower, an agreeable accommodator, and never as a bold, courageous leader with vision and foresight and power and righteous indignation and the ability to wield that power for the common good. Margaret was endowed with that fully, and so she suffered a kind of martyrdom. And I supposed that when I was doing my research, I would discover that the shipwreck that took her life and the life of her husband and her two-year-old son was actually an occasion of martyrdom. And although there isn't compelling evidence to say that it wasn't just um, a foible of fate, if you will, I still hold intuitively and to my heart that she was a martyr. We'll get to that, that even that shipwreck was evidence of her martyrdom. Uh, one of the things that I learned in the research is that when she was in Italy as an expatriate of America, where she found misogyny and hatred of women intellectuals and women of power too intolerable to bear, she lived in such poverty that she felt compelled to leave her beloved Italy where she had met the man of her uh, life, uh, the father of her child, to come back to America because she hoped in America to publish a book that would restore them to some kind of reasonable financial ability. And she had a wealthy uncle who refused to give her anything but a, a tiny pittance of an endowment at the time of his death. And that, in punishment for her outspoken talks against the suppression of women, against the enslavement of Africans, against the genocide against Native Americans, and her complaints about intellectuality that was effete in the face of injustice. If she had been given generously by her uncle, she may not have got on that ship. Had she had reception in the land of her birth as a brilliant leader, which indeed she was, she may not have gone to Italy. So all these mays and may nots, we could perplex ourselves. I will rather look at the life and share with you some of the ideas that I think are most important. A 
kind of thesis for my talk is, everyone loses when anyone is oppressed. And if Margaret Fuller was a martyr, it was a martyr for the rights of women. So she was a proto-feminist. She very strongly advocated that women should receive equal educational and employment opportunities as men. And she was in a time where that was not the case. Actually, it's still not the case. But it was decidedly not the case in her lifetime. She was also a champion of abolition. She came rather slowly to that, but when she came to it, she came with full force. She also came, as I said a few moments ago, to decry the genocide against the Native Americans. And she spoke plainly that she had been misled, as so many were, that the Native peoples of the Americas were resistant to civilization and they were savage and barbaric and they needed to be killed as they were and put in concentration camps as they were. But she said, it's a lie. I've been to the West and these are wonderful people and what we have done is a blemish on our high ideals and our democracy. She was not well loved for saying these things. She was also an advocate for prison reform. And uh, she, she, her heart went out to so many women who were imprisoned because they were prostitutes. And she was thinking, well, if you deny women opportunities of education and upward mobility and employment opportunities, what are we doing? We are crucifying half the world. So I, I got a lot of books on um, Fuller, but the one that I used most is The Woman and the Myth by Chevigny. I may be mispronouncing her name. It's a French name. Uh, it's considered by many to be the authoritative work. It's, it's almost 50 years old. Um, but it's a great book, and the author uh, divided into several sections the life of Fuller. The first section she talks about is friendships that she formed. Mind you, she was a contemporary of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and Theodore Parker, all of whom she knew. William Ellery Channing uh, was a friend, a, a mentor. Um, his son was someone that she had some hopes uh, of romantic connection with. But the young Channing was terrified of this blue stocking, this outspoken feminist, this intellectual who had peers, perhaps, but no superiors in her milieu, which included, as I said, Theodore Parker and and, and Emerson. I want to read a quote uh, from Emerson about her in terms of being a friend. It is said that Margaret made a disagreeable first impression on most persons, including those who became afterwards her best friends, to such an extreme that they did not wish to be in the same room with her. This was partly the effect of her manners, which expressed an overweening sense of power and slight esteem of others, and partly the prejudice of her fame. She had a dangerous reputation for satire in addition to her great scholarship. The men thought she carried too many guns. And the women did not like one who despised them. So she was famous for saying things like uh, about herself that her intellect was unmatched anywhere. And people didn't uh, like that. But uh, then again, she was moving in a, in a milieu that forbade women to be outspoken, that discouraged women from reading or speaking at all. More, 
um, after establishing that she was a very difficult person to like, a little bit later in his description of Margaret Fuller as a friend, her arrival was a holiday and so was her abode. She stayed a few days, often a week, more seldom a month, and all tasks that could be suspended were put aside to catch the favorable hour in walking, riding, or boating to talk with this joyful guest who brought wit, anecdotes, love stories, tragedies, oracles with her, and with her broad web of relations to so many fine friends, seemed like the queen of some parliament of love who carried the key to all confidences and to whom every question had been finally referred. So he had a very high estimate of this person. To be in her company was a holiday. Everything that could be put aside was put aside to be with this incredibly brilliant, powerful, charismatic, and influential woman. Margaret's father was Harvard educated. He became a lawyer. She kind of despised the fact that his life was mostly concerned with prospering and being part of the establishment and having a good home and a good reputation. She wanted something greater, something that would change the world, she thought, was a worthy way to dedicate your powers and your abilities. And she saw in her father a kind of bourgeois resignation to uh, an unimportant role. She struggled with that because she also felt tremendously indebted to her father. At age four, he began to train her to be accepted at Harvard University as a student. Not that he expected that she would be. He knew that she wouldn't. She was barred, as other women were barred, from attending Harvard as a student, but he trained her in the classics from age four. And at age six, she remembers that he would keep her up way past her bedtime, drilling her and testing her. And she supposed, in later life, that, that was why she had migraine headaches, and nervous prostration, and that she was haunted through her whole childhood by apparitions, she, unable to sleep. She became somnambulistic. She walked in her sleep. Sleep was a stranger to her for long periods in her life. Her health was never good. But her proficiency in Greek, in Latin, in German, in French, she translated Goethe, but she wrote an important book on Goethe. She taught French and German to people who would later study those things at Harvard. She sent her brothers to school at Harvard with her earnings as a teacher. Her father died suddenly and unexpectedly at a time when she was just about to launch a literary career and instead, she took up the running of the household. Her mother was a very retiring woman. And it's interesting, when you read about Margaret Fuller, she felt about herself, and that quote that I opened up with is really revealing. She felt that she was both man and woman. She ascribed intellectuality to her masculine side and intuitiveness and tenderness to her feminine side, but these forces in her were in a tumult. She wished to ascend into a world where you had to be a man to ascend, but she didn't admire men who had ascended there but were devoid of compassion and tenderness and feeling, and so she had this great struggle, and I think that's one of the reasons why she was such a difficult person to befriend. In fact, when I was studying her life, I, I thought she was very Promethean in her function in society. Prometheus who stole fire to give it to the humans who were naked and without implements to do anything in their environment to better themselves. Prometheus stole from the gods the gift of fire and he gave it in opposition in defiance to the gods, and consequently was cursed. 
that uh, he was bound and his liver was eaten by the eagle who would come every day and the liver was restored. And the liver represented the emotions. And Margaret's emotions were plagued all the time by this struggle. Who am I? How do I fit into this world? Again, it supports my contention that she was a martyr because there was no room for a Margaret Fuller in New England. She was even discountenanced by, by people who were originally her friends because she was outspoken, she was forthright, she was critical. And they just thought, how can this woman be? And they mounted um, campaigns against her that really must have hurt tremendously. I'm going to wind up with some of the um, things that I think are really, really significant that she did. Uh, Margaret, as I said, uh, was conversant in classics. She had a classical education like a Harvard-trained uh, young man would have. And she got that courtesy of her father and people in her environment. She sought this out. And then she taught these things. Um, one of the things that came to her attention was that in Europe, women did not experience as much oppression. They still op uh, experienced oppression and uh, c consignment to uh, compartments of life that were, in her estimation, outrageously limiting. And indeed, they were outrageously limiting. But at least in, in Europe, there was this phenomenon of salons, where women would hold forth as intellectual leaders, and they would teach. And Margaret actually had a six-year program called Conversations, where she met with other brilliant women in New England, and she spoke about social justice issues, intellectual issues, aesthetic issues, and art, and literature. And it became, in many people's estimation, most of her bi biographers agree, that it was one of the catalysts for the feminist movement in America, these conversations that she held. These began in 1839, so she was almost 30, and went on for six years. She was the first woman allowed as a member of the major male intellectual society, the Transcendentalists. Hmm? She was critical of the Transcendentalists. She detected a kind of solipsism in the Transcendental idea that, you know, so much concern with the self and self-expression and, and introspection. She said, that's great, but it has to be balanced by activity to make the world a better world, social reform. She was the first editor of the Dial. The Dial was the Transcendentalist's journal that was um, inspired to counter the misrepresentations of the Transcendentalists. And Emerson selected her to be the first editor. She proved to be a very capable and worthy editor. One of her articles was called The Great Lawsuit, Man Versus Men and Women Versus Women. And it was the precursor of her book, Woman in the 19th Century. Woman in the 19th Century was, in many persons' minds, the equivalent of Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women, which had been written previously. And it's not clear whether or not Margaret Fuller had read Mary Wollstonecraft or was aware of her book, but her book was as important in terms of the American landscape of thought. It was an expansion of this article, The Great Lawsuit, Man Versus Men and Woman Versus Women, and she she describes that idea that's the thesis of this talk that I'm giving, that when you oppress women, men are oppressed. When you oppress Africans, then the oppressors, be they Europeans or whomever, are oppressed. Hmm? That you cannot harm another without harming yourself. And a society that countenances injustice is a society where no one is safe and no one is dealt with justly. So 
Margaret Fuller inspired many people. I want to end with um, a poem, which is a, a poem that I love uh, quite a lot. Um, it's by Walt Whitman. Whitman was very inspired by this great personality. And when he describes in this poem from Leaves of Grass, A Woman Waits for Me, I think he is describing Margaret Fuller. He's describing the persons who inhabit the space that she held open so that human advancement could come to the stage where it has come now and to go where it must go, which is a time when we look at each other as spirits having a human experience, not as men and women, like some distinction that like there's a superior and an inferior and there's these relations, this power brokering between these opposites. Whitman, a woman waits for me. She contains all. Nothing is lacking. Yet all were lacking if sex were lacking or if the moisture of the right man were lacking. Sex contains all bodies, souls, meanings, proofs, purities, delicacies, results, promulgations, songs, commands, health, pride, the maternal mystery, the seminal milk, all hopes, benefactions, bestowals, all the passions, loves, beauties, the lights of the earth, all the governments, judges, gods, followed persons of the earth. These are contained in sex as parts of itself and justifications of itself. Without shame, the man I like knows and avows the deliciousness of his sex. Without shame, the woman I like knows and avows hers. Now, I will dismiss myself from impassive women. I will go stay with her who waits for me. And with those women that are warm-blooded, sufficient for me, I see that they understand me and do not deny me. I see that they are worthy of me. I will be the robust husband of those women. They are not one jot less than I am. They are tanned in the face by shining suns and blowing winds. Their flesh has the old divine suppleness and strength. They know how to swim, row, ride, wrestle, shoot, run, strike, retreat, advance, resist, defend themselves. They are ultimate in their own right. They are calm, clear, well-possessed of themselves. I draw you close to me, you women. I cannot let you go. I would do you good. I am for you, and you are for me, not only for your own sake, but for other sakes, envelop in you, sleep, greater heroes and bards. Now, I want to wind up with this death scene. It haunted me when I thought about studying Margaret Fuller. Her two-year-old son, her husband, ten years her junior, a marquis of Italy who was disinherited by his aristocratic family for supporting the struggle for freedom uh, in, in Rome, a, a, a campaign that failed. He was a soldier in that army. She was a nurse at the hospital helping the people who were struggling that Italy would have a, a national identity. And they, 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 they had a child together. And for two years, that child lived with them in Italy, first very secretly, and then later they were more open about it. The child survived a dangerous childhood illness, almost died. So they came, they came more open. They, they had married secretly, it seems. Nobody's really quite sure. But like Whitman was alluding to, she didn't care so much for social conventions. She recognized the love of her life, and she seized it. In any case, they got on this ship to come to where she hoped they would regain some financial ability. They were living in penury. They were dirt poor. And then, 50 yards from the shore of Fire Island, New York, where she hoped to be published, the ship hit a sandbar, and it took hours and hours for it to sink. But she, her husband, and baby were the last people on board the ship. Exactly why that is, I don't know. Perhaps someone can tell. People came to, to get the valuables from the ship, but they never attempted to help this couple. 
It's so sad to think about this. In the very year of her death, one of the things that Fuller wrote was, quote, I am absurdly fearful, and various omens have combined to give me a dark feeling. It seems to me that my future upon this earth will soon close. I have a vague expectation of some crisis, I know not what, end quote. And just days after writing these words, she boarded the ship, the Elizabeth, for the five-week return voyage to the United States. This is very sad. Again, had she been supported through her life? Had she been encouraged? Had she been given financial um, endowment for the great, important work of spreading feminism, equality and justice for women, equality and justice for Africans, recognition of Native Americans? Had she been supported, her fate would have been different, certainly. I am a little bit assuaged in my grief by these last words that I want to read. These are words of Margaret Fuller. She's talking about her identity as a spiritual being having a human experience. I remember how, a little child, I had stopped myself one day on the stairs and asked, how came I here? How is it that I seem to be this Margaret Fuller? What does it mean? What shall I do about it? I remembered all the times and ways in which the same thought had returned. I saw how long it must be before the soul can learn to act under these restrictions of time and space in human nature. But I saw also that it must do it, that it must make all this false true and so new and immortal plants in the garden of God before it could return again. I saw there was no self, that selfishness was all folly and the result of circumstance, that it was only because I thought self real that I suffered, that I had only to live in the idea of the all, and all was mine. This truth came to me, and I received it unhesitatingly, so that I was for that hour taken up into God. In that true ray, most of the relations of earth seem mere films, phenomena. She had a conviction. She had this premonition of disaster, of death. But prior to having that premonition and writing it down, just days before her death, she wrote down the words I just shared. She saw herself as an imperishable spirit with a mission. And I think that she really very swimmingly, very powerfully, very effectively fulfilled much of that mission to vindicate the rights of women, American women specifically. She became a champion of women and men who were forward-thinking. Prometheus means forward-thinking. Civilizing, compassionate, loving. Margaret Fuller was an incarnation of Prometheus. And I like the tale of the myth of Prometheus, where Prometheus is liberated, finally, from the torment. And I believe that Margaret Fuller was liberated from the torment. She departed this world with the two men, one little two-year-old and one ten years her junior that were the loves of her life. And that is my fervent hope, that indeed she was liberated from the torment of Prometheus and that she could look back before going on to her next work with satisfaction. I have given fire to womankind to light this dark world that women and men can be equal, equally divine, equally radiant beings on this planet Earth. Thank you very much.